What's up guys? Welcome to Forensic Friday where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing, that's right, my makeup. Today's video will be featuring the ColourPop Going Coconuts palette. If you guys are interested in seeing what all these shades swatch like, I will leave a link to my second channel in the description below where I have a full in-depth swatch and review video. For today's look, I wanted to do something really, really soft and natural, but also a little bit glam because I'm going to be taking some photos after this video. All the other products I'm using in this video will be linked in the description below. So this story is about a couple named Ruby and Earl Morris. They were business partners and they were married for over 20 years years. The Morrises had three grown children. They operated their own accounting and tax preparation company which grew to make them into millionaires. They lived in Phoenix, Arizona. On June 4th, 1989, Earl Morris decides to go to California to see his eldest daughter Kay perform in a concert. It is said that Kay was a very talented country singer and that um Ooh, I don't know why I decided to put on foundation first when I said I was going to put on this. She was really, really talented. Um, so talented that everyone believed she was on the rise to stardom. So Earl Morris went to see his daughter perform while Ruby Morris decided to stay behind on that trip. Um, she had already made plans with their other daughter, Cindy, to go uh, help her shop for furniture for her new apartment. But Cindy never showed up. Cindy. But Ruby never showed up that Sunday morning to go shopping with her daughter for furniture. I have no idea why I didn't put on concealer, but I'm gonna do it right now. So Cindy drove out to her mother's house, but Ruby wasn't home. Cindy noticed that the burglar alarm was turned off, but her mom's purse was still there. Her car was also still there, but it was not parked in its usual spot. Her daughter also noticed that a lot of the things in her mom's house was out of place, which was really unusual for Ruby because Ruby was very meticulous. She always kept things in order and clean. So this was really weird and out of character for her. There was a lot of laundry that wasn't done, like dirty clothes that was left in the washer and not like cleaned or dry. They were just like wet, dirty laundry. There was um, also a carpet cleaner that was left out or like a rug cleaner that was left out, which is weird as well. The tap was also leaking in one of the bathrooms. It was left running. There is no way that Ruby would have kept her home this way. So her daughter was convinced something was wrong and something really bad had happened to her. Plus the carpet cleaner, just a random carpet cleaner sitting out for what? For what? But the most troubling thing was that a 22 caliber pistol that the Morrises kept was now missing. This is when Cindy decides to call the cops and report um, her mother missing and that something was wrong because obviously this is just so out of character for her. Initially, cops believed that this was just like another missing a person's case that, or a runaway or something like that because that's what police do. They always jump to the conclusions that it's a missing person or a runaway. I don't know why, don't ask me. Earl learned that his wife was missing. He told the family he would head straight home right away to find out what was going on and what had happened. These were hoping that he could possibly give them some answers to help finding his wife or, you know. We all know that the number one suspect when someone goes missing is usually, usually the spouse, usually. Earl Morris told police that um, their relationship was pretty good. They never had any crazy fights or anything like that too serious. I mean, the occasional fight, but nothing too serious and that uh, she had actually done things like this before where she has left, but then she would return. Earl also told police that although his wife had done this type of behavior before in the past, that it was usually because she was angry and she would usually call or say something before she left. She would never just disappear without saying anything at all. But this raised a little bit of questioning to the police as to what exactly happened to her. 
He also confirmed that the 22 caliber pistol that they had owned was not in the closet where he had last left it. So now the police is thinking there's a possibility of a runaway, there's a possibility of a suicide, there's a possibility of a homicide. Police are just scouring the boards here looking for any information and clues that they can get as to what happened to Ruby because now it's just all over the place. It's kind of like they really have no idea. Earl Morris also told police that his car had broke down on the way home from California and that he had rented another car to drive the rest of the way. But the detective on that case noticed something really odd when he looked into the trunk of that rental car. He noticed a flight tag that was recent that flew from San Diego to Phoenix. But when the detective searched a flight list of names of passengers on that flight, none of them listed Earl Morris. Although there was a G Norris listed on the passenger list. Police showed the airline crew members a photo of Earl to see if anyone could recognize him if he was on that flight or not. One of the flight attendants remembered him. She said that she remembered him particularly for his bad quality in his toupee. <laughs> So, yeah, get a better toupee, dude. I don't know what to say. Obviously, police was faced with this really big inconsistency in Earl's story and what the flight attendant said and what actually happened and the evidence that they had. So they decided to go back to the Morris family home and um, search for more evidence. They were looking for any evidence that they may have missed on their first visit to the family's home. They brought in their special ID text and they used luminol. When luminol is sprayed onto an area, a black light is used. Luminol will actually glow when it comes in contact with blood enzymes. Forensic scientists began their search in the master bedroom. They sprayed everything down with luminol. They started with the headboard guess what? It turned blue. Very distinctive blood pattern that was also found there. Almost immediately the detectives were able to recognize um, the distinctive pattern of the blood. To them they said it looked like um, high velocity or high impact from maybe a gunshot. According to police, only a bullet could produce something of that nature, a splatter like that. A knife stabbing or a beating would produce a totally different pattern of blood splatter. So just based off of that, they knew that it was a gun. As they continue to spray luminol throughout the house, they also find tiny blood droplets on the surface of the mattress. They find blood inside of the mattress. Ooh. What was I thinking with this? I don't know. And in the bathroom, they say that the entire shower stall lit up when they sprayed the luminol. Luminol also revealed a tiny droplets of blood on the outside of the patio. I'm gonna try to spread this out. Um, I was attempting to do a halo eye, but I just didn't like the way it was coming out. They also noticed that the entire carpeting in the bedroom started to glow like the whole carpet started to glow that's a lot of blood just from that the detectives were able to gather that whatever happened it was pretty gruesome um they didn't have a body so at this point there was no proof that someone had actually died but even if it was just a fight it was a pretty gruesome fight the only thing is the police had no idea whose blood that was actually that they found in the Morris family home. Obviously, the police suspected that this blood belonged to Ruby Morris, but um, they needed proof, so they had to send the blood over to the DNA test lab for samples. They only could assume that it was Ruby's blood because they didn't have a body at this point, so investigators had no way of comparing the blood found in the bedroom to Ruby Morris's blood to see if they were a match or not. However, police did have a little trick up their sleeve. So what they decided to do was to compare the blood sample that was found in the home to the members of the actual family to see 
if this could possibly be Ruby's blood. So for instance, in case of children, oftentimes the children will have 50% DNA from one parent and 50% DNA from the other parent. A DNA profile set of the children's parents can give scientists an idea of who the other parent is or was, even if they do not have blood from that other parent. This specific testing meant that if they tested one of Ruby's children and um, half of the DNA, 50% of the DNA came back and it was Earl's and the other 50% of the DNA matched the blood that was found in the family home, they wouldn't really need a body. They would know that the blood that they found was Ruby's. Does that make any sense? I don't know because I don't know how to explain it, but I hope that makes sense. When comparing Cindy Morris's um, DNA to the blood stains found in the family home, they found one matching band. But police found something really, really strange. They found that when they compared Earl Morris's DNA to the DNA of Cindy, they found no matching strands, which meant that Earl was not the father of Cindy. If he was not Cindy's biological father, then who was? When they compared Earl Morris's DNA to his oldest child, Randy, they got the same result. The DNA did not match. Actually, the DNA of Randy matched that of his grandfather. When law enforcement learned of these DNA results, they charged Ruby's father with incest. According to the DNA test, Ruby's father had sex with her when she was just 15 years old. But this family was not done. They actually had another secret that was about to be revealed. The Morris children said that their mother had recently become depressed when she found out that her husband Earl was actually having an affair with her sister. In fact, Ruby and her daughter had actually caught the two together at a Phoenix airport and Peggy secretly flew to Phoenix to meet with Earl. Ruby did confront him about the affair and he reportedly refused to end it. Now police were looking at Peggy the sister because she had motive as well. She had motive, the father had motive, and Earl had motive as well because he was actually with Peggy. So they all could have collectively come together and decided to do something about Ruby or they could have very well separately on their individual own decided to handle the situation. Police found that although Peggy lived in Louisiana, she had planned a trip to come out to Phoenix around the same time that Earl had flown to Phoenix. What she had motive and opportunity. It was found that Peggy had a planned trip to San Diego around the same time that all of this happened and that Earl took a trip to San Diego. So she has motive and opportunity to, you know, do something to Ruby. Although I would hope that her sister would not do that. Sisters can be weird sometimes. They discovered that she had a planned vacation going to San Diego that same weekend that she had made phone calls to Earl um, on her trip up there. He admitted to police that she had planned to meet up with Earl shortly after Ruby had disappeared. But she claims she missed her flight. Girl, please, come on now. Police knew that Earl had actually been to San Diego, not just because of the baggage claim tag on his suitcase, but because they also found his car in the airport parking lot. The car appeared clean, but when investigators sprayed the inside of the car with luminol, blood stains appeared on the passenger side of the floor. They found so much blood in the car that the person that it came from had to definitely be dead. When forensic science compared the DNA found in the car to the DNA in the bedroom of the Morris family home, they found that the DNAs matched, which at this point, scientists concluded that the blood was Ruby's. They didn't know where the body was. They didn't understand if, why, if, Earl transported the body down to San Diego why he did that but finally they got a crack in the case when they realized that the Morrises owned a boat in the marina checking with employees at the marina 
um, investigators were able to find out that Earl was actually at the marina taking his boat out on a ride on June 5th. When police went to search the boat, they discovered that it was missing. So the Coast Guard was asked to help locate the missing boat. They told police about a mysterious fire that was on a boat that had burned down around that same time that all of this would have taken place about 13 miles off the marina. There was actual footage of the fire taken by television news crew. There was no survivors, no people, no one in sight. The first thing they noticed that was unusual was the way that the boat burned. It pretty much burned from the inside outwards. And normally a fire like that will start in the engine room or in the field department. There was a lantern in the middle of the boat right on top of the melted fiberglass. Keith thought it looked like someone had thrown it there possibly to start a fire. Records indicated that Earl Morris actually rented the boat earlier that morning and returned it later that afternoon. Around the same time that the Coast Guard noticed the boat on fire. Police were starting to think that the body of Ruby Morris was on that burning boat and it sank to the bottom of the ocean. But prosecutors believed they still had enough evidence to prove that Ruby Morris was murdered. Earl Morris was charged with the murder of his wife, Ruby. But it was not over. The prosecutors still had to prove their case. It's very difficult to prove murder without a body. Like it's just, it's not impossible. And in some states, it's a little bit more probable. Prosecutors had to prove to a jury that the murder had occurred without the evidence to actually back it up. According to the prosecution, Earl Morris entered the master bedroom early morning on June 4th. He shot Ruby, then drug her body into the bathroom where he cleaned her up. After that, he dressed her in her regular clothes, put on a baseball cap over her head to conceal the gun wounds that she had experienced, took her down into the garage, put her in the passenger seat of his car. Since his car did not have a trunk, he really had no choice but to place the body into the passenger seat of the car. He was essentially trying to make her look alive in case while he was driving he passed anybody and they looked in the car. Earl then went back inside of the house to clean up all of the blood. He cleaned the blood from the headboard, from the bathroom, from the carpets, all which was later revealed by the luminol. Earl then drove to San Diego about a 400 mile trip with his wife's dead body in the seat next to him. Blood continued to drip from the wound on Ruby's head and fall to the floor and underneath the car seat. Later discovered by the luminol test. Earl actually stopped once for gas and no one noticed that his passenger was dead. No one. Say that when Earl arrived in San Diego, he towed his boat to the launch. In broad daylight, loaded Ruby into the boat along with the murder weapon and some of the bloody sheets and clothes. He also brought with him a lantern and some gasoline. 15 miles offshore in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, Earl Mars prepared the boat by pouring gasoline everywhere and lighting the lantern. Executors say that he was hoping to not only bury his wife's body, but all of the remaining evidence that would prove that he had done this. I believe he left before being spotted by the Coast Guard. Neither Ruby Mars' body or the boat was ever found. In court, Earl Morris um, delivered a crazy defense. He admitted that his wife was dead and that her body was indeed on the boat, but he proclaimed that it was not his fault and he did not murder her, that she had been depressed over months and possibly even years from his affair with her sister and she became really depressed and decided to take her own life. He discovered that she had taken her own life and in return decided to take her body out to sea and burn it in a boat because he felt like people would maybe blame him for it. I don't know, sounds, sounds. He tried, he tried. He said that Ruby felt guilt because he, Earl, was not the biological father of two of her children. The crazy thing is, is that up until this point when he actually admitted to getting rid of her body, everything was circumstantial, okay? They didn't have a body. So there was no one to say that Ruby Morris was actually dead. It was all circumstantial evidence that they had against him. So. 
why he decided to admit it I know maybe the circumstantial evidence he felt was really strong but now they have actual evidence that you tried even if even if you didn't murder her you tried to cover the murder up it just looks really really bad so police finally got what they wanted she popping y'all she popping <laughs> mm -hmm. blood spatter evidence showed forensic scientists that ruby could not have committed suicide earl said the gunshot wound was on the left side of her head when he found her but ruby was right-handed it would have been impossible for a right-handed person to shoot herself in the left side of her temple using her right hand especially with the long barrel on that pistol the strongest evidence they got was the blood spatter pattern on the headboard the evidence revealed two levels of blood spatter on top of each other you cannot create that in one shot this is how forensic scientists knew that there were two shots also someone committing suicide does not shoot twice in the head thanks to a forensic science and some good police work earl mars was convicted of murder and sentenced to 25 years to life okay you guys this is the finished makeup look please let me know in the comments down below what you thought about this case and also my makeup look my soft glam makeup look i hope this video brought you guys some release from boredom of being on isolation and quarantine if you like videos like these then check out my last episode i will leave it linked on the screen right here don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more Forensic Friday, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!